since I know that the laying aside of this what body of mine, now look at that, since I know, since I know my spirit, who I am really, that the laying aside of this body that my spirit occupies, or this body of mine, or my spirit, will come speedily as our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me. So God revealed to him that he was going to go home pretty soon. Now catch that revelation. That is powerful. Because God has shown us something. Go to the next verse. Moreover, I will diligently endeavor to see to it that even after my departure... I love that. Or decease. You may be able at all times to call these things to mind. Wow. Lord help us. Now remember they didn't have the Bible back there. In Peter's time. In fact he, he, he spoke that in their right. He's writing it down. He sent that letter. They didn't have all, all that we have. Can you imagine how they held on to that? Man. And we got, I got all kind of translations. All right, let's go to the another. So we need to, at times to remind each other about these things because they can slip your mind, okay? For we were not following cleverly devised stories when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ of Messiah. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, grandeur, authority, of sovereign power. So we're listening to somebody that was an eyewitness to what the Lord did. He, Peter was an eyewitness that he died on the cross. He was resurrected. He ascended in heaven. He ain't talking about fairy tales here. He's talking about truth. Now listen to this. Boy, this goes right along real good next. For when he was invested with honor and glory, identify he, Jesus, from God the Father, and a voice was born to him by the splendor, majesty, majestic glory in the bright cloud that overshadowed him, that is Christ, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased and delight in. Now we know that he said that at Christ's water baptism. We also know that he said that, that God said that when he was, when Jesus was up uh, on the mountain. What mountain was that? <laughs> we got to find that out. On top of the mountain, Peter heard the voice. Powerful. So we're not talking about no fairy tale here. Pays us to pay attention, doesn't it? Wow. So we're not cleverly or, or following some cleverly devised story. Now either Peter is the biggest liar in the world. And when someone says, well, I don't believe what Peter says. That's bordering on really saying, God, I don't believe you either. God says, this is my beloved son. How many of you know there's a particular religion that says God has no son? Now, wait a minute. God said he had a son and he was well pleased in him. And this religion says God don't have no son. Somebody's lying. You ever thought that out? Can you see that? I wonder who's lying. Is there any doubt in your mind? Better not be. So we can, we can drive that stake down. Peter was an eyewitness of this powerful, powerful statements that he is saying. Okay, let's go to the next verse. We actually heard this voice. Peter, you actually heard this voice? Who was this voice? This was God's voice. Where, where did you hear him? Up on the mountain. Jesus was up there. 
Elijah was up there. Moses was up there. John was there. James was up there. Wow, what a moment. We actually heard this voice bored out of heaven. <clears throat> we were together with him on the holy mount. How many remembers the Mount of Transfiguration? Good. Follow me now. Don't let the devil put you to sleep. You might find something you need here. The next verse. And we have the prophetic word made firmer still. You will do well to pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal, squalid, and dark place until the day breaks through the gloom and the morning star rises comes into being in your hearts <clears throat> so what is peter saying prophecy is important i think now i may be wrong but i think one fourth of the bible is prophecy i think Check it out and prove me wrong, then we'll correct it. But that's what I think at this moment. But a lot of it is about prophecy. So what is Peter saying to us? We better pay attention. You know, when you read over in Hebrews, it said that the gospel was preached to them, Israelites, as well with us, but it didn't do them no good. Why? Because they did not mix faith with it okay so thank god god's given us a measure of faith that we can believe now let's go to the next verse <clears throat> yet first you must understand this now he's talking to us here's what he's saying to every one of us in this room you must understand this that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation loosening or solving That no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation. Directly from God. All right, next. Now, that's something for us to wake up to, especially in this day. I, I want to say something, and you can just leave that right there. When you go back and you read about Noah, it says, they did not know until the flood came. Now catch that. They did not know until it was too late. Mo uh, Noah and uh, his family was in the ark. The door, God shut the ark, and the rains came. They didn't know. Now just think, if I didn't preach prophecy to you, you would probably say, well, I didn't know. Nobody taught me about prophecy. Nobody taught me about these things coming upon the earth in these last days. I didn't know. Now think about this for a moment. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I believe, I believe that is um, verse 5. Check, check that out. It's close there. 5, 5, 5, 1 Thessalonians it takes time to open this Bible of mine, but we can take our time because this is so important. First five, uh, it's three, three. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse three. <clears throat> Catch this. Now we already we already know that the people during. Noah's time didn't know until it was too late. We got that? That's how important it is for us as a church to preach the truth, to get the people to know what's going to happen. Now catch this. When people are saying all is well and secure, <coughs> there is peace and safety, then in a moment, unforeseen destruction, ruins, and death, will come upon who? Them. Now, who's them? 
the unbelievers. But we that are believers, being and a lot of Christian people, they don't know because they don't teach it in a lot of churches. Now look at that. Destruction, ruins, and death will come upon them as suddenly as labor pains come upon a woman with child, and they shall by no means escape, for there will be no escape. But it didn't say destruction would come upon us. Have you noticed that? Upon them, the unbelievers. Boy, it's a good time to shout. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. See, knowledge is so important. I know there's different types of knowledge. There's a knowledge of this world, which is foolishness unto God, but there's a knowledge of God that we have and know, and because of that knowledge, we can prepare and make sure that we are looking for His appearance. For He's coming after those that are looking for His appearance. So we see the same thing as it was in the days of Noah. They didn't know about that sudden destruction until it was too late. The people in our time, in Thessalonians, Paul is saying, the people of this world is not going to know. Now, what kind of sudden destruction is going to come upon them? Let's just say the Lord comes and the church is taken up. All right, let's paint the picture. Mike's already been demonstrating to me. Let's say that uh, Mike and <laughs> these are our two pilots right here. <laughs> these are our two pilots. And these are all the seats in the aircraft. All right, there, there's a Christian, there's a Christian, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. But all these other seats, they're not Christians. All of a sudden, pilots go and you guys go in the twinkling of an eye. Boom, we out, out of that airplane. What's going to happen to that airplane? Well, someone says, well, it's probably on cruise matic Well, is it? That, that'd be fine for a while. They could do a lot of praying. Uh, that would be good. <laughs> but it'd be too late to, to catch the rapture. You could pray all you want. To. But you might get saved at that point. Good point, you know. So eventually when you give out a gas... You ain't going up, you're going to go down. Now think about this. You come right in and your airplane crashes in New York City. So you're destroyed. All of the people that are in the way of that airplane is destroyed. Sudden destruction, boom, comes upon them. How many can see it? All right, that's good. See, I want you to see this, that <clears throat> coming to church should not be dull we got to realize how blessed we are. And I know we can get tired. I've, I've been just about every place you've been, probably too, and more so. But I tell you what, when you understand the truth that God has given to us, somebody ought to just say hallelujah. hallelujah. Very good. Two of them, not the two parties said hallelujah. 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 Sudden destruction. Now, this is God's plan. We're talking about prophecy. This is not a fairy tale. That's what we just read. Peter's saying, this is not a fairy tale. This is not some clever idea, some mere man thought up. This is what God says is going to happen. Now, we've been talking about prophecy. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> We've been talking about prophecy. How many remember? I got a little smaller stick tonight. <laughs> remember that last stick I had last week? All right. We all see our, our image here. Okay. That's just an image. You can stand him up this way if you want to. That's an image. Well, what has that image got to do with prophecy? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, but he couldn't remember what it was. But Daniel 
was able to interpret that dream for him. I want you to see the night, and we already know that the head, which was gold, was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Remember that? So look at it this way. One, two, three, four, five kingdoms, and then the last kingdom is the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that destroys all those kingdoms, and there's one kingdom on the earth, and that will be our Lord's kingdom, and we will be priests in that kingdom. Now put, um, hey, I didn't know you had that up there. That's great. Look at that. Look at that up on the board there. That's great. Now, it's, no, it's not complex. I knew when I first started studying, it was like, wow. You know what I mean? But after all, I've been studying for 50-some years on it, so it's, it's very simple to me. So you don't have to remember every detail. I'll lose you if I go into every detail. All you have to remember is, can you see to the far left here, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a teaching, so we want to get down to simplicity. 606 to right here at the end of the tribulation years is what we call the time of the Gentiles. Everybody got that? The time of the Gentiles. Everybody got that? Wave at me if you got it. That's all you got to remember. That's all you got to remember. When you see that image, it's the time of the Gentiles. All right, now we're going to go into the Scriptures. Go to Romans. Boy, that's a good picture. I didn't know we had that up there, but we do. All right, uh, turn to Romans 11. Romans 11. I would encourage you to read. Most people stay away from Romans 11. I wish we had time to read the whole thing, and you could get the gist of it. But I don't have that time. So we're going to start with verse 25, Romans 11, 25. And I want to give you an idea of, of the time of the Gentiles. Now, we've got to remember, <clears throat> before 606, the cross, all the way back here to 606, there's a lot on there that I could share with you, but I want you to get one thing at a time. Of course, you know, you got David and Solomon, Solomon and David and Saul, and you got the, all the way back to, to uh, Adam and remember that w this way. You got that? Okay. So, you, so we come all the way down through the time of when Nebuchadnezzar came into Israel and captured the Israelites and took them into captivity. Everybody remember that? All right. So that, the Lord was showing Daniel and all of us what is going to happen to God's people. This really is all about the Jews right here. I want you to see that. This is all about showing the Jews what's going to happen. Because when all this was put down in the Bible, you don't see anywhere like United States of America in there, do you? South America, North America. So you've got to remember when the Scripture was written, it was all around the Mediterranean Sea. you got that picture. It's so important when you read the Scriptures. It's talking about a, a geographical location there, Israel and all those Arab nations around there, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, all the way to Europe, Turkey, all the way to uh, Greece. Germany, all of that was in the, all of that is in the Old Testament. So forget about America. I mean, there's, I, I wish I could just lock doors and we could spend eight hours a day, and, 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 but it, it takes time. Okay, so you got that picture there. This is all about what's going to happen to the Jewish nation. You see that rock right there? There's a rock that's going to come down and, and get that dude. All right, so here we are. Now we're talking about the times of the Gentiles, which we are now in the times of the Gentiles, ever since Nebuchadnezzar time. 
down to the last ten kingdoms, which are the toes of that image, the last ten kingdoms. Now, remember back in those days when you talked about kings, you, you, were, you weren't a president. You weren't voted into office. You, you were a king, King Nebuchadnezzar, king so-and-so. Now, they had uh, big armies that could capture a lot of the other kingdoms. So let's begin to read. Here we go. Are you ready? Now, this is Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Paul is talking to the Gentiles. And he's saying, you better not get too cocky now. God is not through with the Jews. Keep that in mind when we read this. I wish we could read it all, but the time element. So here we go. Lest you be self-opinionated, wise in your own conceits. Now when you read that, what do you think Paul is thinking about these, these people? Hmm? They're a little cocky, aren't they? Yeah, say, say he's in your own deceit. Don't be cocky, opinionated, wise in your own conceits. I do not want you to miss this hidden truth. Now remember, there's hidden truths. There's mysteries in the Bible. Somebody want to name one? The, all right, the church age, the church age of mystery, the mystery of the resurrection, the mystery of, of godliness, holiness, the mystery of uh, wickedness. And this is a mystery here. Look what it says. This hidden truth. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. Revelation came little by little down through the years. Do we understand that? We, get, we have the whole revelation here in the Bible, but it didn't just, boop, there it all is. It came year after year, hundreds and thousands of years. It took a long time to get all the scriptures written down. All right, we understand that. Very important. <clears throat> so when you come all the way down to Paul, Revelation was still coming in. Revelation, the Bible was still being written all the way to John, to Revelation. Scriptures were written. So the people way back in the Old Testament didn't know what Paul knew, didn't know what Peter knew, didn't know what James knew, because that hadn't happened yet. That was in the process of Revelation coming down to man. Very important we understand that, because that will help you to understand the scriptures, when you read it, I'll, I'll give you a question. Do you think Paul knew some things that Peter didn't know? Think on it. Yeah. Paul knew some because he got the personal revelation from God Almighty. So that's further down the line. Peter was one of the first 12. Paul came further down the line. Uh, after the uh, resurrection, after the ascension, uh, all the way down, I mean, maybe 15 years down the road there, Paul came into being, and the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Christ dealt with Paul, okay, and gave him this revelation about the church age. All right? That'll help you understand some things. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Hidden True and Mystery, brethren... Now, we know he's talking to Christians, brother. A hardening insensibility has temporarily befallen a part of Israel. To last, notice this, how long is it going to last? Until the full number of the ingathering of the Gentiles has come in. Now, catch that last part. It, they're going to be blind that, that, that Christ was their Messiah until the full ingathering of the Gentiles, which we are, comes in. So it's a temporary blindness, and you'll see that also in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 about the veil. Remember the veil over Moses' face, and it talks to the veil over the Jewish Minds, okay? All right, now let's go to the next verse. Paul is, 
I don't know how much you know or how much you see it or what you're aware of, but there's people today that are saying, and church people, that are saying that God is through with Israel. And how many knew that? It's called, uh, it's called, uh, huh? Replacement. Yeah, replacement uh, theology, okay? In other words, the church has replaced Israel, which is not so, and Paul is making that very clear here. Okay, so I don't have time to go into all that, but how many understand that's what some churches teach, that God is through with, all right, Paul makes it very clear. Here we go. <clears throat> now, verse 26, he puts his attention on Israel. And so all Israel will be saved. Now, that doesn't mean every Jew and all Israel, but let's read on and you'll see. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will vanish ungodliness from Jacob, which is Israel, which is the people of God. You could say Jacob, Israel, the people of God, of the Jews. All right, go to the next verse. And this will be my covenant, my agreement with them when I shall take away their sins. All right, move on to the next. From the point of view of the gospel of good news, they, the Jews, at present, now he's talking about at present, at that time when he was writing this down, are enemies of God. They disbelieved. They didn't believe in the Messiah. And you read over in Zechariah, not Zechariah, Zap, yeah, Zechariah, that they will, they will see their Messiah coming and going to land on Mount Olive. When, when Jerusalem is surrounded with all the nations of the world and is, and is crushing Israel, two-thirds will be killed, one-third will be saved. That's why when you look, we looked at that other scripture about all Israel, that is all Israel whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All right. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. All right. From the point of view of the gospel, good news, they, that is the Israelites, the Jews, at present, when Paul's time, are enemies of God, which, <coughs> which is for your advantage and benefit. Now, how do you interpret that? Well, he turned from the Jews because they weren't going to preach the gospel because of their unbelief. And he turns to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles took the gospel and took the message and believed that we're saved, and we became the church. Do you see the point? Now, the question is, if let's say ask our, ourselves a question here. When I read and study the Bible, I ask, all, I, I ask myself all type of questions. I say, Bob, I say, I say yeah. <coughs> How many do that? We've got, we've got a few in there. What would have happened if the Jews took the mandate and went with it? Well, we probably wouldn't be here today because if, if they'd have done it, the, the their we would have probably had this 2,000 years gap. Now, I'm not saying that's gospel. I'm just saying think about that. So it was really to the Gentiles' advantage that they missed out, and God turned to the Gentiles, and the church was formed, and the Gentiles believed and took off and evangelized in the world. Okay, you got the picture. So... Ask yourself questions, Sarah. Don't get confused, but just ask yourself some questions. All right, let's finish this now. So, which is for your advantage? Now, who's yours? You Gentiles and benefits. But from the point of view of God's choice of election, of divine selection, they are still the beloved, dear to him for the sake of their forefathers. Have you ever done anything for the sake of others? God does. 
He made promises to the Jews' forefathers, and he's going to uphold and carry out his promise for the sake of the Jewish forefathers. And the Jews are going to come around, and at some point, God's going to deliver them, <clears throat> and many of them are going to come in during the tribulation years and believe in, in, in Christ as their Savior. As their Savior. All right, uh, I want to move on here a little bit further here now. Let's move on a bit further. All right, next verse. <clears throat> For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them. So he's given the Jews gifts. Now, we could, uh, could say we could apply that to the people of God today also. Many principles, yes, and promises are made to the Jews but being that we have been grafted in, remember, we've been grafted in, and that's, that's another uh, thing that he brings out here, uh, that the promises come to us too. So we have great benefits there. All right, it says, He never withdraws them when once they are given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace to, or to whom he sends his call. So if you've been called for a specific thing, go for it. As far as God's concerned, it's nailed down. He's not going to revoke it. It's up to us to pick the mandal up and go with it. Okay? How I many do you understand that? All right. Remember, we're not talking about myths here. We're talking about reality. We're talking about truths. All right, next verse. <clears throat> Just as you were once disobedient. Now, he's talking to the Gentiles here. Remember, when you read the Scriptures, who is God talking to here? Somebody tell me. Us folks, Gentiles. Just as you were once disobedient and rebellious towards God. You mean we were once rebellious? Huh? <laughs> Have you always been obedient like you are now? <laughs> I hope you're obedient. But now have attained his mercy through their disobedience. Oh my goodness. Now who is there? Jews. Through the Jews' disobedience, we have attained God's mercy. I think we ought to stop and pray a while. <laughs> we ought to have a little bit, you know, appreciation for the Jews, even though they were disobedient, but it was for our benefit. Hallelujah, that's powerful. But has God given them up? No. This is what Paul's coming to. All right, let's move to the next verse. So they also now are being disobedient when you are receiving mercy. That's us. We're receiving mercy now. But they're being disobedient. They are not still believing. Now, let me say this. Down through the years... Many Jews have believed, but the, the nationwide, the whole nation is not spiritual yet. When you think of Israel, you think of individual Jews, but you think of the nation of Israel. Right now, they are not a spiritual nation. We understand that. But in that spiritual nation, there is people that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? All right. Now... <clears throat> That they in turn may one day, through the mercies you are enjoying, we are enjoying right now, also receive mercy, that they may share the mercy which has been shown to you, that is us Gentiles, though you, <coughs> through you as messengers of the gospel to them. So now it's, they, they started it out. They wouldn't carry out the Great Commission. Most, a lot of them weren't. God turned to the Gentiles. And now 
we are in return to share the gospel with them. Through you, uh, is that right? Is that through, through you? Am I saying that good? Through you as messengers of the gospel to them. Powerful, isn't it? So this is why we support Israel here, and we send money over there periodically to help the Jews to come back to Israel. Now we know we're still in that prophecy that Jews are being brought back to Israel. I believe they have 8 million now, 8 million Jews in Israel now. Remember, they've only been a state for the last 62 years, I think it is. <coughs> and now they're up to 8 million and surrounded by enemies. But well, we can't go into that right now. All right, let's move to the next. For God has con consigned, pinned up all men to disobedience, only that he may have mercy on them all alike. Now, you can break that down to simply, it's hard to understand some things, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all been put in that little pot. We've all sinned, disobedience, but God has showed mercy to all of us, and that's why we're saved. Not anything you've done or didn't do. God picked you out and called you, and that's why you responded to him on that day when you accepted Christ. It's hard to understand that. I wish I could park here for a while to understand. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. That's 32. Let's see what I got there. All right, I want to stop there, and I want you to put uh, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, 30, and 31. We'll start with 29. Now, when you read prior, the other scriptures prior to 129, you're going to learn a lot. But we don't have time, so I've got to make it quick. The scriptures prior to that talks about God takes the weak things to confound the wise. He takes the simple things to confound the wise. Someone says, Bob, you're so simple. I know that's why I confound you. <laughs> now, so all of that, so that no mortal man should have pretense for glory and, and boast in the presence of God and say like, well, I know why I'm saved, because I'm saved for all the good works I've done, and I've been a good boy ever since my mammy brought me into this world. Boo, boo, boo. No, it ain't that way, folks. I don't care how good you were, and that's good to be good, but that don't save you. Our Savior saves us when we put our faith and trust in what he did at Calvary for us. Then we are saved. All right, so we have no mortal man can boast about anything we've done in the presence of God. We can't stick our face in the presence. Well, you know, I gave $10 one time to the cancel, the cancer fund. I have met people give 50 cent and they got thousands of dollars flip 50 cent and put it in the plate and they just wow man I gave 50 cent well that's good we'll take 50 and 50 more <laughs> but listen that's boasting in God's face I am what I am by the grace of God, period. And you walk in that, and you'll have fellowship with God. Turn to the next verse now real quick, like. I'm going to let you go at, as early as I can. <coughs> now, as we come on down, and I wish we had time to read First Thessalonians, that whole chapter. But Paul is saying, but it is from him, God, 
Almighty that you Gentiles, all of us here, have your life in Christ Jesus. God took us and put us in Christ. Wow. Why did he do that? Remember what we read a while ago, Revelation 1, 5? He loved us. How do you remember that? He loved us. You know, I think it was Sunday, we were talking about power. Power. The power of love operated in God, and that's why we're saying, He so loved Mike. Wow. Powerful, isn't it? He so loved Bob. Wow. He so loved each and every one of us. That's why love is the greatest of them all. Sometimes I counsel, and, and, and I know what people have problems. I, believe me, if any man understands that, I do, and Susan does. We've counseled with hundreds of people over the years with so many different problems. But the biggest problem, and they didn't know it at the time, they were ignorant, was them. <laughs> Your problem is you didn't show love one to another. But let's move on from that. But it is from him, that is God Almighty, that you have your life in Christ Jesus. We would not have it if it had not been for him. So therefore, there's nothing for us to boast about. All right. Whom God made our wisdom. God made Christ to be our wisdom from God, revealed to us a knowledge of of the divine plan of salvation. He revealed it to us by His Holy Spirit. His divine plan of salvation through Christ. He revealed to us that we were sinners and lost. And then He said, but I want to reveal to you the salvation that I have provided for you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Previously hidden, notice it was previously hidden, manifesting itself as our righteousness. So today we can say that God took our sins, Christ took our sins, and he gave us his righteousness. We have become sons and daughters of the living God. We have become priests unto God. We have become his children. We are in his family. Look what it says. Thus making us upright. Notice this. Thus making us. Who made us upright? And putting us in right standing with God. And our consecration. Making us pure and holy. And our redemption. Notice this. Providing our ransom from eternal penalty of sin. There'd be no penalty for us because Christ took the penalty. He ransomed us. He redeemed us. He's bought, he bought us back, bought us back, and brought us back to the Father. Not many of us, and I haven't always in my life, but as I get older, I'm beginning to see God's perspective on things. And not so much out of my own perspective. But I see God so loved us. He wanted us back. So he set the plan of salvation. And he took the initiative. And brought us back through Christ. Our Savior and our Lord. Wow. Next verse. So then. Shield of faith. As it is written, powerful. Let him God who boasts God tonight that we are saved and we proudly rejoices and glory. We've been made priests 
and proudly rejoice. God is not mad at us anymore. In the Turn Lord. to 1 Corinthians. We'll Lord. close on this next verse. I don't know how I got on this, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> it has to do with prophecy, doesn't it? <laughs> you, you can be sure of it. Verse uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So remember when we rejoice, we rejoice in what the Lord has done. All right? Look at that. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, and we are grafted in Christ, because God engrafted us in Christ. Remember, we just read, it's because of Him that we are in Christ. Because of Him, we've been grafted in Christ. The Messiah, He that is us, the person that's been engrafted in Christ, is a new creation. We got to see it. We're still crying about the old creation. All right, now, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you guys. I've been there. <laughs> the cross. Over here, we were sinners. We passed through the cross and accept what he did on the cross. And we come out on this side. Most people don't know when they, re when they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I want to put a little emphasis on that. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, that means he's boss. I am convinced that a lot of people have done that, but they don't realize that he's Lord. Now, what does it mean by him being Lord? That means he's boss. What he says goes. And what we say, go out the window. Can we graft that? But you see, it's not a dominating relationship it's a relationship that is most precious i would not want to be lord of my life i would not want to be boss of my life can we grasp that because i can show you a lot of people that they their own boss ain't nobody gonna tell them what to do uh, they're going to find out one day the Lord is God and there is no other. So when you come and, and, and you actually just, just give it all to God. He's boss. He's Lord. Whatever he wants me to do. But I have learned and I've read the scriptures. He's a good boss. He'll give you raises when you haven't even earned them. He just likes to give. He's a giving God. So we've got to see that he's Lord. Now, if I will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're saying that he's my Lord now, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thy shall be saved. And when we really believe and have made Christ our Lord and confess him, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my boss. Who's your boss? Jesus. Who's Jesus. your boss? Jesus. Who's your Jesus is my boss. Who's your boss up there? Jesus. Hey! That's why we can cast all our problems on him. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Ah, oh, the fellowship I have every day with him oh, and with my precious wife and how I love fellowship with the brethren and the sisters that are in the spirit. And I sense most of you guys are. All right. <clears throat> he is a new creature or creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual conditions has passed away Behold, the fresh and new has come.
Now, what does that mean? That means Adam, the first Adam that was in me, who I came from, was nailed to the cross. And the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, lives in me now. I do not have any allegiance to the old Adam no more. I died to him. He was crucified. And I'm a brand new creation. Remember what Peter said about he was a spirit living in that tabernacle? You are a spirit living in that tabernacle. And one day, You'll lay that old tabernacle down. You won't need it no more. Because it can't operate and breathe in heaven. And God's going to give you a brand new tabernacle. And we're going to tabernacle with him. Hallelujah. Oh, let that get down in the recesses of your heart, children of God. All right. Let's move on real quick. We're going to close. Five more minutes. So the old condition's gone. The old Adam's gone. Next. Oh, did I tell you to run that up there? All right, let's look at that again. For all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself. All right, who did? Who reconciled us back to himself? But all things are from God. All things are from God who through Jesus Christ, God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Notice, to himself, to God. Received us into favor. All of us is in favor. Brought us into harmony with himself, with God. And gave to us the ministry of reconciliation that by word and deed we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. And he wants to use us. I have, am having the best time with this Campbell thing. Susan can tell you we are passing the word. I, I just want to end it with this. It, it's so powerful. I know people laugh and I don't care. I'm free. I'm free. You're going to laugh. The joke is on me. It's all right with me. Laugh. I, won't, I like to see people laugh. But you realize when I give that to somebody that their destiny can change from serving Satan to serving God right on this computer that, uh, and all these um, DVDs that Mike puts on that website of ours, which we all have a part in that, can take them and bring them out of darkness into light. This little card right here, God takes the foolish things to confound the wise. They can take that card, go home at night, and hook on their computer and bring this church right up into their living room. Mike is on there. Dars is on there now. Yours, uh, yours is on there, Dars. Yeah. You put it the other day? You got it the other day? Yeah. The serenity prayer. Willie's on it. Rick is on it. Charles is on it. Michelle's on it. And all of us is on it. That little card can bring a person from darkness into light. The information, there's enough word on that website that they can become strong Christians and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. God takes the simple things to confound the wise. Son, i got a question for you. You might not know this, but how do you hide a camel in the desert? You camouflage him. Check me out on the other side, and I'll save you a chair at the shield. God bless you. That's so simple. So simple. And you have put, you have put into that person's hands 
the gift of life. Can we grasp that? Wow. The other day, that revelation just sunk into me. Wow. Powerful. And there has been 7,193, I think it is, people that have turned on to that website and heard all of us, really, because when I preach on there, you, you guys are there too. They learned about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.